So now we are going to talk about testing. And um, I guess one of the, um, the important um, things about testing is in regards to cholesterol. I know that some, some of us feel that cholesterol has been, um, has been made a very important factor because we can treat it and the pharmaceutical industry can um, have a good income from its treatment. But in reality, there is some fractions of cholesterol that will make an individual more um, at risk for developing cardiovascular disease. So the first question that I have is that, uh, do you uh, routinely test for uh, lipids of fractions, um, Dr. Hickey? Yeah, yeah, always. Um, I think the biggest problem uh, that, that I've seen over the years is, is the concentration, the obsession with cholesterol. And cholesterol uh, really has nothing to do with it. It's, it's basically a lipoprotein size and the number of lipoproteins. And if you look at all the literature dating back to, to the 60s, it's about the LDL, the LDL particle. The LDL particle is the lipoprotein. I tell my patients it's a protein shell that helps sink the fat that's inside of it. And when we measure cholesterol, we're breaking that shell apart and we're measuring how much cholesterol is inside of it. And it has no, really very little relevance to whether or not that particle can penetrate the artery wall. So most of the literature shows that it's a gradient-driven disease so that you have to have a number of particles and they have to have a certain diameter to, to, to penetrate the endothelial gap. Thank you. Dr. Mason? Um, I certainly look at uh, lipid profiles, uh, primarily focusing on the HDL, LDLs. Uh, the intermediates, I think, have some importance in looking at the pathway towards the development of the LDL particle. Um, I haven't seen any uh, development of it yet, but I'm pretty certain that at some point in the future we'll see um, attempts to identify different uh, idiotypic forms of lipoproteins that may genetically have much more you know, impact on a person's risks. Uh, they are proteins. So everybody makes proteins of different types, and it would be very interesting to see research directed towards finding ways to identify classes of people that have a different form of HDL, a different form of LDL. Right now we're just, gener we're just looking at a you know, single large group of chemicals identified uh, you know, by density gradient analysis and other technologies. I think someday in the future we'll see immunological ways to identify the different sum classes because there may be more uh, potent uh, oxidative effects of certain forms of LDL. I know there's work uh, underway now to develop synthetic forms of HDL <laughs> yes. uh, for use. Um, who knows where that's going to go? Uh, but certainly those are potentially foreign particles with a lot more danger than good. So they're <laughs> Martians. Hard to say where that's going, um, and I I have watched the development of what I call the uh, cholesterol propaganda scheme since the '60s, when they started with the Framingham studies and Mr. Fit and everything. And they started identifying a risk factor of uh, lipids and cardiovascular risk. Uh, the population was flooded with a scare tactic. You know, cholesterol is going to kill you. We pretty much knew at that time that dietary manipulation of total cholesterol uh, really had little impact. Total vegetarians can have as high as a cholesterol mm -hmm. as a lard eating, you know, steak and potatoes type of individual. Okay. So the identification of the pathway for develop for making cholesterol uh, that won the Nobel Prize for um, uh, the, uh, I think White, and I forget again his other name, the Texas um, scientist, pharmaceutical industry was sitting in the back of the room going, there's got to be a way to poison that system. And I watched as the drug companies developed thousands, thousands of different drugs and tried testing them. I was involved in looking at a research experiment 
of a throwaway drug from Upjohn called U81667. It caused cataracts <coughs> in rats. And my professor was interested in finding out what the role of cholesterol and the protein content of these uh, 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 lenses was, uh, you know, developing. The music means and, time okay, is up. The, the point is, <laughs> It was, it was you a just won an Oscar. <laughs> big scheme to get us ready to accept the statin drugs when they were developed. Dr. Doctors Gordon. and the public were ready. We'll come back to the same point because we're going to talk about treatment. I think the value of testing is that it encourages compliance on the part of our patients to follow a healthier lifestyle. And in, for me, a healthier lifestyle, living on a toxic planet is always encouraging people to be on supplements that have value. And so I really wanted to bring everybody's attention to the paper published uh, out of Harvard Medical School by Deborah Showerman, where she talks about the level of lead in a given bone, which they test non-invasively, actually determines how soon you go blind with a cataract and how soon you die of a heart attack. Now, those of us in chelation are not entirely aware that chelation doesn't actually remove lead from your bones because bones are too tightly bound. But I like things that are gonna motivate patients to take better care of themselves. And so the thing is with statins under the, under the, uh, the dark umbrella that they now find with the increased diabetes, the increased muscle pain, and now the memory loss, uh, it was really not refreshing to watch Fox News Health Special a week ago in which they were suggesting that the time has come to get back to the basics, exercise, lifestyle, niacin, fiber, and things like that. And I'm really hoping <clears throat> that we can use tests that will encourage a healthier lifestyle on the part of our patients. And for me, that's always been very simple. I was terribly impressed with the work of the blood viscosity. And that test, I think, is now being offered along with the other cardiovascular panels that Dr. Data does. But I think they've pick it, picked up now on the test that Ken Kenzie developed with Realogix. Now, Realogix was trying to show you that the thickness of the blood, I, <clears throat> that would be not easy to measure because theoretically, since blood is non-Newtonian, you needed to measure the blood live while the patient was hooked up because it's slightly thicker whether in the systole than in diastole. But the thickness of blood was entirely predictive. You could see that menstruating women always had lower viscosity and they're protected. So I like things that really can motivate patients to stay healthy. And when we had worked in the past with Dr. Lester Morrison, who found when he did his cholesterol research, published in 1960 in the journal of the AMA, that it didn't have the payoff that he hoped it would have. And so he became more interested in heparin and blood clotting and blood thickness. And Dr. Roger Bick became the world's authority on what are the conditions that cause us to be hypercoagulable, not just Leiden 5, that one out of 20 women, or one out of 20 people test positive for Leiden 5, but if you have low level infections, you have the antiphospholipid syndrome, you have different things that are causing us to set the stage for so, what Roger Bick, MD, PhD, University of Texas, head of Department of Pathology, now deceased, he was the expert on blood clotting. He said, really, when you went through medical school, you were taught that most of the clots you find at the autopsy are postmortem. So, Dr. Saying, Gordon, sorry no, to interrupt, yeah. but so what you are telling us, uh, besides testing for cholesterol subfractions, you also like to look at viscosity. Right, because the, the, sub, the subfractions, anything you can, if the patient's focused on that, by all means, do everything that they are interested in, because the bottom line, our job is to try to encourage people to have a healthier lifestyle, and they need some help to get there. So Thank an abnormal you. test motivates. So this is a very interesting topic, and I'd like for all of us to learn together. Um, when, you do the, um, when you do your testing and you find a normality, how do you manage it? How do you manage elevated cholesterol, low HDL, and oxidized LDL? And can we just be brief so we can all learn your opinions and then hear from the audience? Dr. Hickey, how do you manage yeah, well, it? The, the, the atherogenic lipid profile Typically, it's small, dense LDL, very small amounts of large HDL, and high triglycerides. My definition of high triglycerides is greater than 85. Okay. And basically, triglycerides are the conversion of glucose into cholesterol, and that's how the small LDL particles are generated from glucose. So I try to get the glucose down. 
Do you, um, Rick, Dr. Mason? Um, yeah, I, it's important to look at patients individually. Um, I'm a firm believer that toxic metals are generators of inflammatory reactions that uh, these lipoproteins are trying to combat, that the plaque is a scab. And if we don't address the inflammatory processes, whatever we do to the lipid profile will have little impact. So, Dr. Gordon? Do right. Dr. Abraham Hoffer was one of my early heroes, so I really like niacin. And Dr. Pauling was my mentor, so I really like high dose vitamin C. I really like tying things to the idea that oxidized LDL is the culprit, and so I really think the day will come that all of us will be testing for oxidized LDL, and that will move more into this area of dietary change and lifestyle because the diet is still our biggest culprit and we have people living on high fructose corn syrup and the triglycerides are up here and we would have people who can't get out of bed to even walk around the block. So I think that lifestyle is what we're trying to use to address these risk factors. So um, do you follow clinical practice guidelines? You know how, at least in Canada, because of socialized medicine, we have <coughs> clinical practice guidelines and they are numbers that we are supposed to aim in treating the patients. So, do you go very low in lowering LDL cholesterol? Um, do you go very low in lowering uh, total cholesterol? Yeah. I personally think that we go too low, and I think that obviously uh, we've made so much of a fetish out of lowering the cholesterol that we are ignoring what an important part of steroid synthesis. I think if we drop everybody down too low, we'll have everybody on Viagra because you won't have very much of the steroid synthesis. So I try to, to, to have some moderation in the idea. I think there are unrealistic goals that have been set, and I express that to my patients. So I'm going to take a brief <coughs> um, break and um, get the audience to participate. Dr. Smith? Hi, Jim Smith, Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, one of the things that I do, um, I, I'm a, I have high cholesterol, and uh, thank God I don't have any blockages going, but I always have my patients every, uh, when I see them, they have high cholesterol, I say, let's see what it's doing in your body first. So I, I send them for scanning, uh, carotid scanning, and um, there's a company called Lifeline Screening that does it for like a hundred and some bucks. And then I'll send them for a heart scan. So if I see those are zero, I say, okay, we've got some time, let's look at, at what's going on. And this whole oxidized cholesterol thing, uh, one of the articles that I recently read, or I think it was a tape I listened to, um, antioxidants. And um, vitamin E is very, very important. And I know there were some um, studies that came out, and of course they, they use the uh, synthetic vitamin E in the studies, like they always do. Mm -hmm. But um, vitamin E is very, very important. I think there's like six molecules of vitamin E in every LDL. Um, there, does, there are studies that show oxidation going on, but, but vitamin C will recover your vitamin E. So I make sure my patients are taking plenty of vitamin E, about 800 I use a day, 3,000 milligrams of vitamin C, and now I've added 15 milligrams of lycopene, and um, I'm using 25,000, I use a beta carotene. Um, so I'm getting good antioxidant effect, and it's been proven that that combination with the E, the beta carotene, and the lycopene, actually um, the oxidized cholesterol does go down, and also there's a reduction in plaque, plaque size. So uh, I, I just think it's antioxidants. I'm really big on basic supplements. I think sometimes we get too esoteric. Too complex. Patients, right, right. And we get away from the multi and the Bs and the Cs and the Es, and I think they're also important. Dr. Wilson? <clears throat> uh, last weekend at the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology, Dr. Peter Longshone uh, gave a presentation on coenzyme Q10 and statin drugs. And he's uh, one of the premier researchers on uh, coenzyme Q10 in the country, and he uh, recognizes that uh, this uh, this um, uh, you know, uh, abundance of, of statin drug deficiency that's recognized by our stat uh, by our colleagues <laughs> is really a ridiculous thing. But he did uh, share an uh, important clinical pearl that I think you'd all love to know is that uh, that there is a very practical use uh, for and good use for statin drugs. If you take and mix some of it with sugar and put it on a fire ant hill, it will kill all the ants. <laughs> and if you also, if you put it on your house plants, it will kill all your house plants. Oh. And so there are some very useful things to do with statin drugs to so tell your patients not to throw it away. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hickey, uh, could you please tell us how, how long do you go and how do you manage? Well, I think the guidelines are useless. Um, they've been proven to be useless um, for years. Um, I think what you have to do is 
change the reason why things are abnormal. And antioxidants are absolutely essential. In fact, there are studies showing that if you raise the glucose, all these inflammatory markers called um, advanced glycation end products develop and they start the cascade of inflammation in the artery. They grab the LDL. They, they capture it, so to speak, into the collagen of the artery. They, they chemotactically uh, cause white cells to, to migrate. They release all kinds of inflammatory. So it's the combination of glucose, the glucose products, the LDL. If you don't, once you, once you get the glucose down, once you get it down by any means possible, um, and, and most of that is dietary with, with glucose restriction. It can be done, anybody's diet can do it. But once you get the glucose down, and you look at the inflammatory markers that I measure, everything calms down. You cannot quench this fire with antioxidants. Oh, no. You have to use a combination of antioxidants, but you have to, you have to, you have to put out the fire. So um, I'm going to let Dr. Campbell ask the question. Um, well, first of all, I think the guidelines aren't entirely useless. Often you can use them to tell the patient that they never needed their statin drug to begin with <laughs> because their doctor never calculated what their target should be, so they don't, they, they're on an arbitrary dose. So, but my question is really what tests do you do? Are you using Berkeley Heart Test? Are you using VAP? Are you using just a lipid panel? And what markers of inflammation? Are you using ferritin or um, interleukin? Or what, what, are, what tests are you doing? Yes, I, I really like the, the NMR lipo profile. It's easier to explain to the patient. I, I don't, the Berkeley Heart Lab, they kind of get lost. It's, you know, excellent technology, but it's so simple to do an NMR lipo profile. It shows you uh, the LDL particle number, which is the single most important uh, predictor of MI as far as the lipids are concerned. Much two and a half times more predictive than the LDL cholesterol. Um, more predictive than the total cholesterol HDL ratio. I also then look at, they'll break it down into how many, so say your LDL particle number is 1300 that increases your risk, that sort of doubles your MI rate, should be less than a thousand. And out of that percentage of LDL particles, how many of those particles are small particles? And they'll tell you the number of small particles, and the small particle has a greater ability to penetrate the artery wall, it has a greater tendency to be oxidized, so it gives you that information, and it also gives you HDL, but it gives you large HDL. And many studies have shown that that's the cardioprotective HDL, because really what it is is small HDLs made in your liver penetrates the artery wall, sort of vacuum cleans the intima, and as it does, it becomes larger, re-enters the circulation, goes back to the liver. That's reverse cholesterol transport. So that information, what I notice when you restrict carbs or get the glucose down by any means, whether it's metformin, actose, low-carb diet, exercise, even starvation or calorie restriction, all of those methods get the glucose down. And once that comes down, I see all these parameters improve. Doctor. Hi, Chuck Mary from New Orleans, uh, Mattery, actually. Um, beautiful concept, the whole issue about insulin. And if we know anything about insulin and glucose metabolism, insulin is the most atherogenic substance known to man. Absolutely. So if we can reduce the body's requirements thereof, uh, potentially tremendous. But what tests? What tests? My point is, what, what are we teaching our patients? Are, are we teaching our patients to reduce the cliff for what? Sixty years ago, heart disease was the number one killer of Americans. We reduced the fat content of the diet of the American uh, public. Low-fat bread, milk, air, water, low-fat everything. This morning when I woke up, heart disease was the number one killer of Americans. We haven't changed a damn thing by reducing the cholesterol. We haven't done anything. Let's stop with this cholesterol. We, as the innovators in this industry, need to stop. We need to teach the things that we're talking about here. Diet, exercise, yes, I got to get up and go do my thing. Um, yes, I need to think more about getting rid of the 
the crud as far as let's get back to the paleo, let's get back. To, what happened with the fact that we can eat a piece of red meat? What happened with the fact that we can't get our testosterone or estrogen and progesterone unless we have the all evil cholesterol, which is in the biochemistry textbook as the cascade mother former of all of the, of the uh, of steroid hormones in the body. I stop professing to my patients about cholesterol. I need to teach them about diet and exercise. I need to teach them about eating right. I need to teach them about the killer of all, the evil is the sugar. Right. Thank you. The evil is the sugar. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's, not, it's not the cholesterol that's the problem, it's how you distribute it through your blood. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Mason and then I'll... Um. Um, yeah, there's still people alive from the Framingham study, the Enhan studies. We had hundreds of thousands of people we've been studying. And what we're studying is disease. We don't study health. We're defining these lipid profiles and various other physiological parameters in the people that die, <laughs> you know? What about the people that are alive? What do their lipid panels look like? And they may, they may look so, horrible. So how do you manage when you have an abnormal lipid panel? Uh, well, um, I look what? at the individual and lifestyle and think about their, their genetic background and uh, those sorts of things and don't get real uh, intense on trying to lower so, somebody's So if he says, Dr. to solve my problem, what do you give him? Um, I, that he I start be with a lot of niacin. Um, I will use uh, plant sterols um, and uh, just dietary reduction of all food. As we know, um, caloric restriction has been the only thing to extend life from everything to fruit flies, to sea elegans, to mice. We, <laughs> we need to look at it humans. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Hickey, uh, for lowering the blood sugar, what do you do first, second, third, fourth? The, the, the things you just listed, what's number one? Yeah, of course, my blood test, I sit with them and show elevated fasting insulin level. For the glucose is over 85, um, you're in trouble. Uh, okay, so you look at the lipid panel, you only see small dangerous LDL particles and depression of HDL because of excessive glucose in the blood. Um, there's a lot of explanations for that if we have time. But the point is, I start them, I, I try to get their, their carbohydrate intake down. You know, that's the key. You know, I get them on an exercise program, but I put them on a low carb diet and then we'll recheck things and see how they're doing. Um, uh, of course, my favorite drugs are metformin and Actos um, because of the effect. Actos and Avandia are very different. And you are not concerned about bladder cancer? No, with Actos? not at all. Um, I've used it for 20 years, and and I check urine urine analysis every three months. Uh, it, I'm a bit obsessive compulsive, but and I and I actually check urinary albumin creatinine ratios every three months because of the criticism of protein and the mm -hmm. low carb diet and I have I've not seen any incidents of that whatsoever but what I have seen is actose alone can reduce triglycerides and the way they do it is by getting it into the muscle instead of increasing the triglycerides as Avandia did so the the whole lipid panel improves with that I rarely get a chance to use it now because of the bad publicity mm -hmm. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolutely amazing drug for the metabolic syndrome. Thank you. Okay, I want to make a, a comment, just a, a model of uh, you know, thinking when we talk about high cholesterol, high triglycerides, and talk about inflammatory markers and stuff like that. Dr. Randolph, who's a pioneer in the field of environmental medicine, pointed very nicely. He said, let me give you a little model. Everyone knows what's an oatmeal look like, you see. Now let's assume that you have never seen a cooked oatmeal. One day you go out of the house and your kids put some water in there and uh, heat it up. Now when you come home, you say, my God, the things has changed altogether. What? And you're a curious guy. You want to find out what happened. You see the temperature is hot. You see it's protein analysis, the protein is changed, Car carbohydrates have changed, fats have changed. But you are not looking outside the heat that caused the problem, you see. So all the inflammatory markers that we are looking at and other markers, high cholesterol, stuff like that, we have to answer what is causing the problem. Just to give you uh, a few simple things, low thyroid, raise your cholesterol level. 
pay attention to that. Look at the basal temperature. Low testosterone, uh, low, uh, increase the cholesterol level. Pay attention to that. Nutritional deficiency is partially checked on that. So the point I'm trying to say is, when you're looking at all these markers, high glucose, high insulin, so look at all those things that are really causing the eventual end result, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, so on and so forth. Thank you. Dr. Sika? Uh, Robin Sika from Connecticut, and uh, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, since I started using the um, time release um, alpha lipoic acid from Zymogen, I've markedly been able to reduce the need for, for metformin. Um, works really well for, the, for anybody who's developing neuropathies as well. So um, I like to not use a pharmaceutical if I, unless I can avoid it, because uh, they all have side effects. Whether we like it or not, they do have side effects. Uh, if we can reduce that, that's always a good thing. So that's one tip. And, and what I, dosage do you use? <clears throat> um, well, it comes in a 600 milligram tablet, so it's much higher than most of the manufacturers. Uh, and you do one before breakfast and one before uh, dinner for most patients, unless it's really a, a true diabetic, not just a metabolic syndrome, and then you can, you can even go three times a day. But the area under the curve is a lot greater, so you get, actually get blood sugar uh, you know, reduction with it, which I, you really don't see with uh, non-time release alpha lipoic acid, at least not in, not in my experience. Um, go ahead. Oh, uh, no, please finish your... I, I was just going to move on to something else in terms of genetic testing, because... Um, you mentioned the Berkeley Heart Lab test, and they do some interesting genetic. I kind of got away from doing genetic testing through Genova and others because I didn't find that it was really changing my treatment Way of much. So I kind of I kind of dropped off because people were having to pay out of pocket, et cetera. But they have some interesting um, genetic markers in terms of looking at the effectiveness or or whether this per person genetically would benefit from aspirin or from statins, et cetera or you could use red, red yeast rice if you wanted to instead of uh, the statins. And I just was wondering if anybody on the panel had experience with that and was it useful or not? It is useful. I think, I think it's useful. Thank you. I'm blurting out here. It is, it is useful um, for many patients who those tests can show that, that a statin will be ineffective. Um, most of my patients, I, I've gotten so weird the patients I attract, they wouldn't even think about taking a statin. You know, if I suggest it, I'm scolded and put into the corner. Which is, which is the next question. Do, do you use, do you ever use statin drugs? I do. Um, and I, which situations do you use it? I, when I, as a last resort. Um, because, you know, many of my patients won't exercise despite my, and you know, I spend hours with them. Um, you know, they can't stay on, they can't get their sugar down, they can't stay on a low carb diet, they're insulin resistant. Um, if all else fails, my job is to try and reduce an MI and, you know, I can get a 40% reduction if I get the LDL particle number down less to 1,000. So, and Crestor is my favorite one because it actually promotes larger LDL particles, mm -hmm. both HDL and LDL. Uh, Dr. Mason, do you ever use any statin? Um, Rarely. Um, with those folks that have genetically predetermined severe hypercholesterolemia, Friedrichsen type uh, cases, they've got xanthomas, uh, their, their risk factors are extremely high. Unfortunately, I find those people to be the most intolerant of taking them. But in those folks, it's like a progeria type scenario. Yes. And is cholesterol the culprit? I don't know. I've not been able to make xanthomas go away with statin drugs. So which one, which statin do you prefer to use and uh, which nutritional uh, supplements and which dosages do you use uh, I've, to minimize side effects? I've been using effects? Crestor uh, in the smallest doses possible. Uh, I have fear of the higher doses. Um, and always CoQ10 to go along with it. Uh, and other things that you know, individualized for the patient. Importantly, my hypercholesterolemic patients, before we could measure TSH, T4, T3, hypercholesterolemia was part of the diagnostic for laboratory studies that defined hyperthyroidism. So all of my patients get a complete thyroid panel, including looking for the antithyroid antibodies. And so many of those people will be asymptomatic, look good in terms of TSH, T4, but they've got an autoimmune disease that's probably contributing to why they're developing atherosclerosis. 
it's well known that Hashimoto's is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And it's also associated with PCOS and other autoimmune diseases. So uh, that's always been part of my approach. Thank you. If we need a, t a, st a statin drug, uh, it's a last resort. Do you have a target so, for TSH? Um, I like to see it below 2.5. Low two is mine. And I'm not afraid to put it in the dirt. Right. I get a lot of flack about that. But when the patient is improving, their lipid panel is looking better, I don't know of any other function of TSH. Welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, I think even many traditional endocrinologists are getting into the bandwagon of aiming for a TSH of less than 2.5. Are you serious? I yeah, am, the, the, because you know, I've been getting letters from endocrinologists that I to call, to practice CYAS medicine. Yes. You refer them to the endocrinologist, and uh, they tell you that they are aiming at um, a TSH less than 2.5. You, you see free T3 levels at the 2 to 2.3 level, and you see the TSH completely suppressed. I think it's you know, relatively useless. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, hyperthyroid. But, but at the same time, in, and that's where practice guidelines come in. We can uh, evaluate deiodinase enzyme activity. Yeah. We look at T3 in the blood, it says nothing about T3 generation within the cells, so it's really kind of a questionably useful test. Yeah. When the patient responds to T3 supplementation, that tells me there's something wrong with their conversion of T4 to T3. And, and so my question to Dr. Gordon, just to close this chapter of statin use or not, and then I let the audience to participate. Do you use any statin, and in which circumstances, and which one do you use? I do not use any statins. We do now have, effective July 1, a test that you need to write down. PremierHeart.com has a EKG that is multi-central, and it will replace angiograms, and it tells you who's going to die and who's not. So you may want to write down Premier Heart, because when you have a motivated patient, then you can use genetic testing, and you can get into this thyroid and do all the things. And since I am really a, a devotee of avoiding the clot, uh, we use the oral EDTA along with mucopolysaccharides, which thin the blood like heparin, and I have patients taking things like natokinase and buluki, so I really focus more on keeping patients alive. In 20 years, I have yet to have a single patient of mine have bypass or stenting. I cancel it since I used to be in radiology. I know that a 90% blocked LAD means nothing unless you've done a PET scan. So I'm moving you into the kind of tests that I do to keep my patients alive. So, been so quite basically you, you have more concerns about viscosity again than you do about cholesterol. Correct. Thank you. Dr. Campbell? Um, yeah, I just wanted to make a, a couple of comments, I guess. Number one is um, not to underestimate the value of vitamin D in the prevention of cardiovascular disease because of multiple pathways that it affects. Number one is that um, you can get a blood sugar reduction equivalent to metformin or exercise with vitamin D. So that that's uh, Dr. Annis. I forget his last name. It's okay. I, I see it written. And so that's his research. So that's important. You'll also see blood pressure reduction with vitamin D in, a, in the average of about 8 over 6 um, nano, nano, um, millimeters, millimeters of mercury reduction in blood pressure. So there's multiple ways that vitamin D will reduce our risk of MI up to 40% reduction in MI. You want to save a million hearts? Get everybody's vitamin D level up to up to at least 40 and maybe maybe substantially higher. The other piece I wanted to comment on is not to under not to overlook the gender difference in men and women when it comes to glucose because we know that blood sugar is such an important factor in glycating and, and oxidizing that LDL and women manifest their glycemic intolerance as a two hour postprandial glucose intolerance rather than a fasting blood sugar elevation. So men, you can identify that fasting blood sugar above 85 as a problem, but women will have normal fasting blood sugars for up to eight years uh, when they're having an impaired glucose tolerance two hours later. So be careful of that, and you'll, that's part of the reason, I think, why women are slower to develop cardiovascular disease, among many other reasons. Thank but you. You've got to be careful of that, that gender difference. That's a good point. That's a very good point. Dr. Mason, what if they have antibodies to the thyroid, what do you do? Um, I am gathering information currently uh, regarding the effects of mercury detoxification and its relationship to lowering antibodies, TPO and TG. There was a study published out of uh, the Netherlands that looked at simply removing amalgams 
and its effects on lowering anti-thyroid antibodies. So I believe that mercury has some role in triggering that autoimmune disease. Has you know, anyone used low-dose naltrexone? Huh? Uh, have you heard of anyone using low-dose naltrexone for that autoimmune I, disease? I have in several patients with autoimmune-related diseases, but I haven't applied it to Hashimoto's. I've used it in MS, uh, RA, uh, and some of the more serious, you know. Uh, uh, Hashimoto's doesn't get much attention because it doesn't kill people. Well, they consider it to be benign in a way, yes. uh, and which most is the problem. Of, uh, most endocrinologists but, will just say, uh, that's not a big deal until your, your uh, TSH is 6 or 13. Uh, the, uh, it needs to be addressed earlier. It's an autoimmune disease, and there's no good reason to have the body attacking any other organ in the so body. So what do you do? You have antibodies. Do, do you give them more thyroid, or what do you do? I certainly put them on thyroid, even if selenium. the thyroid panel looks Pardon normal. Me. Selenium, too. And selenium, indeed. And selenium. selenium uh, and uh, have no problem putting their TSH mm -hmm. low. They, they have marked improvement in their symptoms of weight loss, energy levels. Uh, before we leave the statins, too, uh, I'd like to um, uh, remind those who were at uh, Minneapolis at the Eye Mosaic of Dr. Roberts' uh, discussion of his use of statin drugs as anti-inflammatory agents. This is a big new trend in terms of trying to explain what benefits statins may have, but he was very specific about what patients he selected for it. He talks fast, uh, and I wish I would have recorded it, but he has you know, clear evidence that it has some anti-inflammatory benefits in some people. He thought atherosclerosis was an autoimmune disease. Well, I think what I gained from his talk. One of the new indications for statins is elevated HSCRP. Yes. Which we would probably manage in a different way, but that is because of the anti-inflammatory effect. Now, to close the, uh, this segment, um, the question that we have is, do you use the linospoiling Dr. Rath protocol to treat lipoprotein little a and uh, with vitamin C, proline, and L-lysine? Dr. Hick. No, I haven't started. I've, I've, I've been researching that recently, but I haven't used it. Of course, I use a lot of vitamin C and lysine, but I haven't, I haven't used that combination yet. And because we know that, especially for women, statins will increase lipoprotein little a. So we don't know what are we improving. Yes, I, I, I do use it fairly routinely, uh, and I would say about 50% of patients respond with a significant, significant lowering of their LPA. Dr. Gordon? Uh, I have uh, not been favorably impressed with the adding the proline, but I, of course, have everybody preferably on 8 to 12 or 16 grams of vitamin C. And I try to teach people that this inflammation story if you look at the report out of Harvard, cytomegalic virus is present in about 96% of the population, and it is definitely part of the plaque and ties to hypertension. So when we talk about anti-inflammatories, since I teach oxidative medicine, and not everybody will use ultraviolet blood or ozone, I can get some of that oxidant effect using some of the advanced forms of silver that are available. But I try to simplify it. My patients are all told that my acronym is FIGHT. That stands for food and focus infection, genetics, heavy metal, hormone, toxin. Because we are surrounded with an epidemic of autoimmune disease, and very few people pay, pay the toxin card because we don't have everybody doing the measurement of toxins, but my programs are tied to address the entire epidemic of autoimmune disease, and it's under the acronym food, infection, genetics, heavy metal, hormone, toxin. You will find, if you seek in any of those areas, payoff. Everybody's eating a food they're sensitive to. We have leaky bowel. We need to do something. That starts in the cold. So I'm really pushing the broader picture because we're all going to be living to 90, but we sure aren't going to be looking good when we're 90 unless we pay attention to the whole approach. And, and you know, I think that's a very important point. I have to say that we have a very exciting afternoon and many other topics to come.